Fine, okay. Welcome to this uh, second session in here by Keith Packard. This one on, as you see up on the title slide, changing the X server development process for fun and profit. Sure. Yeah. So give Keith a big hand, a big welcome. Thanks. Thanks for dragging yourselves back from lunch early. Okay, um, this is a talk I've been wanting to put together for quite a long time. Uh, I think it's about time to try to give it a, uh, try to, we have enough data collected now that I think it's a, a reasonable time to take a review of what we've done in the last uh, three or four years with the X server development process. Um, we've gone through a pretty radical transformation trying to get to a more uh, reliable release process and a more, um, a more, uh, a better quality of code being put into the X server. Um, there were some uh, people at the beginning of the change who uh, decried the change in the process. There were people at the beginning of the change who were very excited about it. Um, and I want to see if the, if the fears were realized and if the uh, hopes were, uh, were, were attained. So um, back, when, when, uh, the X, back, when, back in the X386 days and in the early Xorg days, uh, we had an old, the old, old development model, we'll call it, where all of the people with commit access would just commit directly to master. And at some point, the release manager would say, please, please only commit stuff that you really want to have in the release. And then at some point, the release manager would just say, okay, I'm just going to cut the release today. And they would ship the top of master and tag it. Uh, this obviously required a lot of co uh, cooperation and collaboration. This worked great in the X3D6 days when only four people were allowed to put code into the X server at all. Um, when we changed to the Xorg environment and lots of people could contribute to the X server, and we had a lot of people with direct commit access to the uh, repository, there were some scalability issues. Uh, oftentimes, uh, inappropriate patches would slip in at the last minute, and we had some, some brown bag releases. But it was obviously a, a fairly low overhead from the individual maintainer's perspective. They just committed what they wanted, and it got shipped in the next release. Um, and then we decided uh, this is a little too much like anarchy, and we want a little more control. So we, we, uh, the same process was followed for a long time uh, during the, uh, kind of the, uh, the integration phase of the release where everybody would commit directly to master. And at some point, the release manager would tag a release branch. And people would continue to commit, to commit to master and then list the commits they wanted to be put onto master on a wiki page. And so you'd have these git SHA IDs on a wiki page, and the release manager would carefully cut and paste those into git and do a git cherry pick, which was great because that way the release had never been tested by anybody. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, and there was this small matter of overhead for the rele release manager who was constantly trying to cut and paste tags from a wiki page and paste them into the shell. So there was a bunch of overhead. This worked pretty well, and we did this for four releases, four or five releases, all the way through 1.7. Um, I think so it was uh, 1.3 through 1.7. It worked surprisingly well. Um, I think I did a couple of these releases in this particular period, and we were pretty happy with it. But the problem was, was again, the release branch was completely untested by anybody. I mean, there was absolutely nobody reviewing uh, the cherry picks going in, and there was no review of the code. Uh, because, again, anybody could commit to master. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to increase the level of review of the patches, we wanted to have some actual discussion before the code was put into the master branch. Um, and we wanted to have people testing what was going to be released, which is to say the master branch was going to be what was released and people were testing it. Um, and so Peter Hutterer uh, came up with a brilliant idea of stealing from successful projects um, and, he, and suggested that perhaps we should steal from Linux kernel, which has a fairly, fairly reliable release process. Um, it's fairly predictable. Uh, releases are in pretty good shape. Um, and that release process is, is as follows. Only one person commits to the master branch, right? Linus's tree, only one person can commit to that. Uh, in, the X, in the Xorg model, we don't have a single person, uh, but we do have a single tree. Right, it's not, the, the uh, Xorg master branch lives in a well-known place. Um, so we, we don't have this, uh, this, uh, this fake 
anybody's tree are peer trees. Everybody knows where the master of the Linux kernel lives. It lives in Linus's repository. Uh, we acknowledge the fact that there is one central locus of uh, development, and it's the XORG repository on the master branch. Lots of people have started publishing their own trees, however, and this has been a tremendous feature. It means that we can look at other people's trees and review code before it gets merged into the main tree, and people can test their own stuff and do development in their own repositories before the stuff gets merged into master. <coughs> Obviously, this is made possible because we switched to Git. Um, the old models were all based on CVS, uh, where you would want to commit uh, only in, you'd, you could only do linear commits because branching in CVS is a disaster. Um, some people publish their own trees, but other people just, you know, if you just want to publish a patch or two, you just push the patch out to Zorg Dev on the mailing list. You don't have to publish your own tree. This means that people don't need any special privileges to publish patches. If they want to fix just one thing, all they need to, do, need to do is post a patch to the mailing list. They don't have to have an account on Free Desktop. They don't have to have a public uh, Git repository where they can push their patches. So the hope was that this was a, would allow uh, minor developers and people who just wanted to scratch a small itch uh, to join the, join the community fairly easily. Um, the other requirement was that all patches had to be reviewed before they'd get merged. Um, that, was the, that was the plan. Uh, uh, I think Peter proposed this first. Uh, just uh, for the start of the 1.8 release, and we've done two releases with this model. It's not quite the Linux model. The Linux model, Linus really does have the last say. He's really the arbiter of style and quality and, and feature sets. If he doesn't like something, it's just not going to make it in. Um, and that, in a lot of ways, is just because um, the Linux kernel has a lot better history of cooperation and collaboration than the X environment. Uh, there isn't, we don't have a strong single leader in the X environment who everybody trusts implicitly, like the Linux kernel. And so we have a slightly different model. Um, general agreement is sufficient to have code merged. So if there's code out there that a, a patch has been uh, published for, and there's a lot of people saying, yeah, that looks pretty good, then the release manager is obligated to incre in incorporate it into the, into the tree, unless there's some obvious you know, horrible brokenness about it. Um, and that means that the release management process is largely the mechanical process. Right? The release manager isn't doing any serious vetting of code style. He's not uh, complaining about white space stuff. Really, is just checking to make sure that the patches have sufficient review. Um, he's making sure that the patches that are posted merge cleanly. Because uh, if they don't merge cleanly, trying to do fix-ups manually um, by the release manager is almost never a good idea. I think we had a nice uh, Linux kernel merge recently that uh, completely broke the i915 driver by adding a three second delay to suspend and resume because somebody merged and the merge wasn't clean. And somebody patched it up and the patch up was wrong. Um, and the other important thing is the release manager must test the build after applying every patch or merging every branch uh, to make sure that at least the build doesn't break. Um, now one of the things the release manager is not expected to do is to test the release thoroughly after every branch. Uh, the release manager is not expected to have every kind of video hardware and run every operating system. Uh, so in particular, um, oddly, uh, the, with the, the fundamental locus of uh, development in X being on Linux uh, with, uh, and the, um, in the XF86 uh, driver model, um, the, the release manager is, is mostly building the XF86 uh, backend. That's not necessarily a requirement. And in fact, our stable release manager for the 1.8 tree is actually the Macintosh uh, lead developer. Um, and that's working out pretty well. But by and large, the, as long as the build doesn't break after e each patch, uh, you can kind of recover, mostly. But if the build, build breaks, then all kinds of tinderbox things get very upset. So we try not to do that. So obviously, the question is, why did we make this change? You know, why change something that seemed to be a fairly long-standing tradition? It hadn't, uh, you know, it, we were making releases. Uh, the code was apparently working. Um, however, we didn't ever make our release dates, right? Uh, you, can, you can read articles um, in various external news sites um, about you know, how releases were months or years late. Uh, the X server 1.4.1 minor release was like six months late or something. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Nine months. It was awesome. The other, the other great part was that Git master was often unusable. And this meant that our, our fine user base was unable to test the leading development stuff. So we had all this fine development going into master, <coughs> and nobody could actually run it because it would crash on everybody's machine. And in fact, 
people would merge stuff for the Windows branch or the Macintosh branch, and the Linux branch wouldn't build, or vice versa. So it's just kind of a disaster. The big problem, though, was that for large, major changes in the architecture of the server, there was very little discussion. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll actually demonstrate some numbers about that in a little while. And of course, because master was, uh, master was being committed to by the lead developers, and that's where they were building and testing their stuff before having them cherry picked over for the release branch, the release branch got almost no testing. Did Fedora even put it in Rawhide? After a while. Yeah. Exactly. I'm sure it wasn't in uh, Debian Experimental. I, I don't think there was any release pushing out uh, the, the, release, the release branch uh, for testing on a regular basis. So we weren't getting any testing of the release branch. We couldn't get any testing of the master branch because it wouldn't even build. Um, so we were having a lot of trouble with stability and development process. And you can look at this lovely chart and it will show you how much releases slipped each release. Uh, starting with 1.3 slipped a few months. Uh, 1.4 came out pretty much on time. But 1.5 was, you know, almost a year late. And I, I remember reading articles that were like, you know, the, the mythical 1.5 X server release or something. It was kind of embarrassing. Uh, 1.6 came out nearly on time, but 1.7, <laughs> not so much. So, you know, we, were, we had some, obviously, some release timing issues. Now, it's, it's okay if you don't promise to release on a specific date. But unfortunately, XORG is kind of a key component in most Linux distributions. And one of the things Linux distributions like to be able to do is they like to be able to schedule what packages are going to go into their next release. And so they like to be able to count on a distribution, each, each of the packages' uh, distributions coming out kind of in a predictable fashion. Um, and so we wanted to go to a more regular release schedule that actually happened on time. Um, and so not, you can see with the 1.8 and 1.9 releases, 1.8 slipped by four days. And 1.9 came out on the scheduled day. Uh, 1.8 slipped over a weekend. I don't remember what happened there or something. But yeah, sorry about that, four days. Um, and 1.9 came out right on time. And we're hoping to continue this. Um, I had originally thought that we'd want to do a, a tighter, shorter release schedule of three months. But it, it, when you look at the graphs following in the, in the following on information, um, I don't know if we need to do that. Six months seems to be pretty good, the distributions. I did pull back the 1.9 schedule a little bit to align it with Ubuntu and Fedora and, and Migo, my corporate masters. So we're happy when I uh, aligned the release for that particular uh, distribution. So we now are aligned pretty well so that our, our release happens a couple of months before the distribution releases. The distributions need the code. And that seems to be working pretty well. If other people want to change when the release schedule happens, you know, we can negotiate that. Um, but we do have a, a nice, steady, hey, we've done it twice. Maybe we can do it three times. It'll be great. So for this talk, what I wanted to do is I wanted to put together a bunch of experiments. I wanted to, exp I wanted to uh, build a bunch of, um, I wanted to build a bunch of, uh, collect a bunch of data and, 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 and you know, kind of do a scientific experiment. So my hypothesis was that the new X server development model will show increases in developer participation, an improvement in release schedule tracking, and without impacting the speed of X server development. That was my hypothesis. And so I wanted to go collect a bunch of data. So I did a bunch of, I, I used our find not much tool to, to track um, email messages on the development list. I used Git to find out uh, when commits or what commits uh, were merged into the repository, and I collected a bunch of data. And that was pretty fun. Um, so I, it's important, of course, to remember the context of the various releases. And in particular, uh, the 1.5 through 1.7 period, which showed that huge variability in release dates, was also a tremendously active time in the X server development. Mostly what was happening in that time was huge amounts of code were getting removed. Ajax removed half a million lines from the X server. Go, Ajax. I can't do it again. I, uh, <laughs> Yeah. I, I swear, remove, I, I, we should count removing code double to adding code in terms of you know, quality of patches. It's awesome. And of course, there were some significant new infrastructure additions. XI2 was added, the multi-pointer code stuff was added, the generic extension event code was added, just a huge pile of changes. So 1.5 through 1.7 was an extremely active period, and we haven't seen those that level of activity happen since then. So it's important to remember that, that context when you start looking at the, the patch volume in the next, uh, in the next couple of graphs. Um, so here's the cumulative commit count uh, since, uh, since 1.2, which was about four years ago. And you can see it's a pretty straight line, but you'll note that after 1.7 it kind of tapers off. 
It's a little worrisome. Um, I do really like the, the, the graph between 1.8 and 1.9. If you look there, you're actually starting to see the more traditional uh, kind of shape that you want with a bunch of uh, commits being added early in the development cycle and then this, uh, a slope off as you do a stabilization period. Uh, we're seeing something similar after, after 1.9 with a bunch of commits being added in the, in, the, uh, in the integration phase. And then we're slowly tapering off as we're entering the stabilization phase. So things are actually, actually doing pretty well. I'm liking that. Uh, the 1.8 release, we didn't see that particular uh, development pattern. I'm hoping people are getting used to the new model and that we're going to start seeing this uh, more actively in the future. So that, that graph was, uh, was just one count per commit. So every commit got a bump up, uh, pushed the line up by one. Um, I wanted to describe what that graph was. Um, so here we are, here we have lines and commits per day over the various releases. So this was to try to normalize out the length of the development period. So I, the longer development periods didn't show uh, artificially high numbers. Uh, but it is kind of interesting. If you looked at the lines, lines added per day and lines removed per day and commits per day, um, you could note that 1.5 and 1.6 and 1.7 and even 1.4 to some extent were very busy times. And 1.8 and 1.9 were not. So the question is, you know, why is that happening? Are we crushing our developers with this onerous process? Are the commits getting better because they're smaller? I don't know. We're certainly getting a lot more review. Um, so this was done by diffing the entire release from one, from the beginning of the release process to the end of the release process. This isn't incremental additions over the release. This is the total amount of code added for the release. Um, so even if, a, even if a patch in, in a 1.5 or 1.6 period was reviewed and modified several times and the same code had a bunch of changes, those intermediate versions weren't added. So that was to un, not unfairly bias the early development process. Um, here's, some, here's some interesting numbers over, the, over those releases. The aggregate amount, of, uh, aggregate, aggregate amount of code changed over the releases. The same basic statistics just added in kind of a, a stacked bar graph form. So you can see that in 1.5 and 1.6, just you know, wonking great hacks, uh, chunks of the X server were thrown on the floor, uh, never to be heard from again. And in 1.8 and 1.9, 1 uh, 1.8 saw actually more code added than removed which is a little frightening. But 1.9 went back to our traditional pattern of deleting code from the X server. <laughs> yeah, eventually, the X server will be perfect and be zero lines of code. <laughs> which is about the Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's provably correct. You know it has no bugs. It's awesome. That'd be great. Um, of course, the 1.5 and 1.6 saw just aggressive code deletion. Uh, two entire sets of, uh, of dumb frame buffer rendering code were pulled out of the X server. Um, almost all of the K drive uh, backends for Intel chipsets, for, for uh, PC chipsets, were removed. So we don't have the Intel Trident driver or the Intel Mach, the uh, K drive Mach 64 driver. All those are, were gone by this time. Um, there was just no particular reason for them. Nobody was maintaining them. Nobody was using them. And the XORG drivers were far, far better for those chipsets that were getting a lot more active, uh, active love, fortunately. Oh, the other thing, ha, 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 the best part. We removed XPrint. No sweeter patch was ever committed. It's great. Sorry, my notes are on slides. I meant to put them on note cards, but operating open office is not my forte. Um, OK, so um, this, this graph shows you uh, how many patches we were getting per release and how many of those patches were reviewed or even tested or acknowledged by another developer. And this was, this was done by looking at the, all of the commits and then looking for a reviewed by or an act by or a tested by tag in the commit message. Um, you'll note that in 1.3 and 1.4 and those releases, not so much with review. And it, it was surprising to me to find eight patches in 1.7 that had been reviewed. I, I don't know who those reviewers were. They are, they are clearly you know, studly beyond measure because they actually had to catch the person pushing to master before he managed to get the code in. <laughs> hey, put a tag in. Uh, in 1.8 and 1.9, obviously, uh, uh, reviews were required. 
Uh, no, that, yeah, reviews required don't often mean reviews are all included. Um, that, that's obviously uh, largely to, to blame on the release manager, uh, me, at this point. Uh, because uh, a lot of the patches uh, that aren't reviewed are for uh, the Macintosh and PC backends, uh, which have separate subsystem maintainers. And frankly, I trust them to do their jobs. And if they don't want to review patches before they ask me to pull their changes, that's their call. You know, I would like to have them review it. Yep? Does that count merge commits? Because those also won't have an RB tag. Oh, good point. Good point. I, I don't know. I'll have to go back and look at my shell script. Yeah, there weren't that many merge commits actually. Yeah, most of those most of those are fast forwards. But yeah, I should check. So uh, Adam's question was, does this does this also count merge commits? And I just don't know. Um, I, I I don't remember how I ran the shell the, the script to figure it out. So obviously, with our new process, we're actually getting people to look at code, or at least we're getting people to add reviewed by tags. <laughs> um, I I do know that in some uh, major infrastructure work that went into the 1.9 release. Um, uh, both uh, uh, NVIDIA and I wanted to have some major changes put into the server, and you know, we were getting very little review from outside, and so we, we agreed to review each other's code uh, to get it into the server, which was a, kind of a nice you know, tit-for-tat process. You, know, you, 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 you pat, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And I think we, I'm hoping to see more of that. I, I understand that that's, the kernel often works like that, where you offer to review somebody else's code in exchange for them reviewing yours. Now, obviously, you need to find people who are competent at reviewing. So one of, the re one of the release manager's little tacit jobs is to look at the reviewed by tags and say, is that credible for this patch? So unfortunately, you start, to, you start to collect knowledge of who's reviewing patches and whether they're competent to review patches in a particular area. And uh, you kind of pen stuff that hasn't been reviewed by somebody who might actually understand what that change is doing. Also, the uh, Holmes's question is, uh, what about patches from the same company? You know, if you get a, if you if you have one committer from this uh, from a company and a, and, a, and a peer at that same company reviewing the patches, is that okay? I don't care where they work, right? The question is, are they are they credible and are, do they do a good job of review, reviewing? Uh, so, for instance, uh, the Apple patches that have been reviewed, all reviewed by people inside Apple, of course. Those are the people who can understand the code and make it work. Um, I don't have any trouble with that. I think it's perfectly acceptable and. You know, if in, in fact some some companies may have a policy of having the code reviewed before it leaves their doors, um, and that's a that's a I would love to see that as a, as a corporate policy to have. Uh, yeah. Something we see uh, every now and then. I don't know if uh, you are. Yeah. Something we see every now and then in a kernel. I wonder if you see something similar. Is uh, we get a patch from random embedded company with about 25 sign-offs of people at that same company coming in. And you have absolutely no idea whether that was actually reviewed, whether it's a management chain putting sign-offs on, and that sort of stuff. Well, I don't count sign-offs as review. I really look for a reviewed by tag. And again, what I'm looking for is people who have done reviews in the past or who've, who have committed code in the past. So it really is the release manager's job to look at the reviewed by tag and the person doing the review and make sure it looks credible. Right? So you start to gather a history. I'm, I'm sure Linus does a lot of the same thing. It's like, oh, this re was reviewed by somebody who's never worked in this area before. How could they possibly know? You know and so he might not merge that patch. So there is a little more fuzz than it's you know, totally automatic. So there's that general agreement rule that if the patch is generally agreed to be a good thing, then it should go in. But yeah, obviously, if you just get some anonymous patch with no history from that company and no history from the reviewers, then obviously it needs additional scrutiny. It's not going to be prevented from going in, but oftentimes if I see something like that, I'll personally review the patch. And I have spent a lot of time reviewing patches, which has been great. I mean, my day job no longer involves a lot of coding, so at least I get to participate in some way in X server development now. Uh, on, uh, here's a list of the number of contributors, so the number of uh, distinct email addresses uh, in the, uh, in the um, it's not the committed, it's the author line. That's right. So this is the number of authors of patches in the various X server releases. Um, uh, one dot, obviously we had uh, one dot three. I don't know quite what happened, and I also don't know why GNU plot moved the numbers over. Um, yeah, I, I, I clearly have issues with that tool. Um, one dot three, I don't understand why the number of contributors are so small. Because it's just 
Oh, okay. Yeah, one three was a variant of the feature release. Okay. So it was just that could have been me. <laughs> okay. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. And then the 1.4 through 1.7 had you know 80 to 100 c c contributors, and then uh, 1.8 and 1.9 we're seeing fewer contributors. Oh yeah, Plot thanks, GNU plot. Yeah. Okay, that makes me feel a little better. Yeah, I obviously should have tuned the graphs a little better. I hate non-zero based bar charts. That's just inappropriate. Yeah, I apologize for the presentation of the data. Um, so th this is a little worrisome. We need to make sure uh, we aren't uh, excluding people. Again, obviously the 1.8 and 1.9 releases were much smaller. Um, and so we should expect there to be fewer patches. But I'm not quite sure why there would be fewer contributors because we should be, still be seeing the one or two patches coming in from external people who have a particular bug to fix. Yeah, Tim? Have you tried dividing by day? Have I tried dividing this by day? Um, when you divide this by day, yeah, it actually normalizes pretty nicely. But I, I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand why the number of contributors would scale by the number of days. Although maybe, you know. Oh, so we're ex developers moving jobs, and so we got them doubly applied. Doubly, uh, yeah, it could be true. I didn't, obviously, I didn't do any cleanup job like, uh, like Greg Cage and John do with the kernel contributors list to try to um, uh, merge uh, dissimilar uh, email addresses for the same people. Are you taking questions? Oh, sure. Is there a chance that some of this is down to uh, business based companies? contributing through a single channel or uh, with the, the way you're pulling in the commits from Git and the information that you can tell that within a given organization there are multiple contributors? I am using the author tag in Git. So even if you have, uh, even if you have somebody doing integrating patches from multiple people, unless they're lying in their, in their Git merging stuff, we shouldn't see a change in this. So it, it, this may need some more research to figure out why exactly this is happening. Um, it'd, be, it'd be nice to know, you know which people, find out which addresses weren't included in future releases and ask them why did they not have anything to contribute or what. And it's perhaps the other side of this that at the end of the day we're seeing that level of consolidation in the graphics space. You're not seeing contributions from all these random developers from <laughs> older graphics cards anymore, like that stable. Uh, it's, it's important to remember this is just the core server, not just the video the drivers itself. Right, yeah, so. we haven't changed the development process in the, in the drivers. Those are, those are still managed by individual teams. Yeah, it may, it may, be, it may be the X server is just getting kind of done and needs fewer changes. I, yeah, it would be really nice. Yeah. Um, now, this is my favorite chart because it shows the success that we have had in the change in development process. So. We hoped that to increase discussion, at least getting uh, by requiring that patches appear on the email list and get review before they're being um, before they get uh, committed into the tree. Um, our hopes were realized way more than that. Not only did we see a huge, huge increase in the number of email messages and threads about patches going into the tree, but the other non-patch related emails skyrocketed as well. Um, this is, you know, a success disaster. Unfortunately, I use the not much mail program, so lots of email is not a horrible thing for me. But look at the email we got. Yes. Yeah. This is all mail. Um, all mail to the Zorg. When, when was the when did the Zorg list kind of die down? Was it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I tried to I tried to get both. Yeah, just you know, a tremendous increase in mail, especially looking at uh, looking at patches. So uh, a very successful increase in the volume of email. So the research method that I tried to apply was I tried to figure out what graphs I was going to generate before I collected any of the data because I didn't want to bias the results that I was going to present by the results that I had seen. Um, obviously, I have a strong uh, a strong uh, interest in the, the new development model. I think it's working well for me. Um, but I wanted to collect data without, without biasing that in any particular way. Um, and, then I, um, and, that's, and then I presented the data that I collected without any bias, or tried to. Um, so is our new development model a success? Um, obviously, we've had you know, a dramatic reduction in 
the amount of code going into the X server. Is that because of the new development model, or is it just because the X server is not doesn't need to change as much? Uh, busy reading yeah, <laughs> busy reading your emails. There's a lot less code there, than there, used to be. there is there is half as much code there as there used to be. So obviously there is, you know, you might expect a reduction, a dramatic reduction in the amount of patches going in. You know, I, I should have, yeah, I, I could have parsed out which patches affected the code that's been deleted in the earlier releases, and uh, and figured that out. So the question is, have I, have I tried to factor in the kernel development? Again, this is just the core of the X server, not the video drivers. So this doesn't have any, there's no impact here in the shift of code from drivers to the kernel. So this shouldn't be impacted by that at all. There's been no change in the core of the X server to support the new kernel, uh, kernel device driver model. Um, we're hitting releases on time. We're getting more discussion about patches. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. The rele releases seem pretty stable. Um, the distributions aren't screaming at me for missing release dates anymore, so that seems like a feature. Um, I don't know. I think we certainly met Peter's original objectives, and I hope we're not. Uh, I hope we're able to keep going. So with that, I'd like to open up for questions and comments. John? Here we go. Come up. Uh, the first question, I think, would be about reviews in general. Uh, first part about it, what, are there specific criteria you put out what you are and are not looking for in reviews, what type of things to try to catch, or did you just let that kind of happen between the individuals? Um, Peter, did you have some specific requirements for review? I mean, uh, the, 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 we tried to have people understand what the Linux review process was. We wanted to have the, the code reviewed for style and, and uh, correctness, and that the, the patch was a good idea. Um, so we wanted to make sure that uh, the, the, the code was something that should be in the X server as well as being correct code. We've got some official statement of what it means to actually Yeah, so uh, as Peter says, we, we, have an, we have an official statement of what reviewed means. <laughs> yeah. And then I know um, one thing that happens at various companies that require reviews occasionally, you might get an individual who puts code out, has it reviewed, but doesn't heed anything. That is, they'll put the reviewer's name on it, but not do incorporate any of the feedback or anything like that, which doesn't sound like you have to deal with in this circumstance. I haven't seen that. I mean, I, I think the reviewer would uh, would pretty rapidly discover that that had happened. Um, Adam? I can think of one or two cases where that kind of thing has happened, where somebody has put a patch on the list, gotten some review, resent it to the list, m making one of the changes out of the 10 that we suggested, and then eventually what happened with at least one of these patches in particular was we just ignored that person studiously and somebody rewrote it correctly and put their name on it. Um, but I mean, most of the most of the review hap is, um, you know, does are, did you do an obvious allocation error here? Is this a use after free here? Basic C kind of stuff. That's the kind of thing that's easy to get wrong because a lot of the higher level stuff you had to have already known in order to do that patch at all. Is my experience anyway. Yeah. Um, there is another thing to it is that um, if you come in as an outsider and you send a patch to the list, it usually still goes through someone else. So anything input related usually goes through me. So even though I might not always add the review by, I still look at what I merge before I send it to Keith to pull. So you know, there's more review going on than it is directly visible. Right, oftentimes a signed offline. All, uh, sign offline by a subsystem maintainer also means some level of review. And that level of review is going to vary uh, based upon the person who, com who authored the patch. So if you have a person who authored the patch and reviewer who reviewed the patch, both of who are well known to develop correct and, and useful code, then their code may have less review by the, sign -off, the, the subsystem maintainer or system maintainer than code by somebody new to the community. Which I think is appropriate. I don't, I don't think that, prevent, that, that, that uh, presents a high bar or any kind of uh, any kind of uh, bias towards older developers, um, but certainly as you get more uh, more of a history with the community, 
um, you could either you know, go up or down in terms of having your patches uh, have more or less review. Uh, certainly there are some contributors in our community who get studiously reviewed um, even though they've been contributing for years and years uh, just because we've had issues with their patches in the past. Yep. You made mention that the release maintainers got to make sure that what's in the main branch, the, the main release it actually builds. So have you got uh, anything there around automating that process to trigger builds, uh, sanity check? I, I certainly type make after every, every yeah. merge or, or commit uh, on, my, on my machine. Unfortunately, the X server is now small enough that, that doesn't take very long. And we also have a tinderbox uh, running on multiple architectures that check the build more thoroughly. Uh, so if that breaks, then we, that's caught uh, even, even more assiduously. Um, it, it checks a bunch of different configurations. So yeah, we have both. Uh, the maintainer is doing a build, and the, and the tinderbox is catching things. Oh, do we have the, do we have the tinderbox running the X-Test suite as well? Yeah, I didn't think so. <coughs> and Tim has a question as well, right behind you. Um, have you tried looking at the number of commits each unique contributor um, gives? Because that would give you a better idea about like the number of people who are just contributing, say, one oh, or two I, patches. I, I, or... I, 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 didn't, I didn't do that because I, I, I didn't think I would find anything interesting. I should have, just to make sure it was the usual, the usual distribution that we see from projects of this nature, where most of the patches are by a few people, and um, a few patches are by a lot of people. I also, expect to see the same tail off. It also tell you if there have been new contributors, right? Because you yep. can see the names and compare between releases. Yeah, lots of lots of. There's you know one of the nice things about having um, open mailing lists and open archives at this point is all this. Oh, you can collect all kinds of data, and I, I I collected a bunch of stuff that I thought would be interesting, but I didn't I didn't do that one in particular because I kind of knew what it, what it would show up as, and it would be. No, I probably should have just to make sure it was it was the usual distribution from any open source project, but I had not. No. Have you tried anything to sort of encourage more test cases to be in, uh, come along with new code or modified code? <sighs> yeah, that would be lovely. We have a test suite that tests the old core protocol extensively, which applications don't use at all. And we have all these new extensions that app applications use extensively, and which is tested not at all. The problem with the test suite is it's really, really, really hard to add new test cases to the old test suite. And nobody has bothered to write a new test suite. So, oh yeah, so the, the, ex the, the old core test suite doesn't crash the server anymore, at least, thank goodness. <laughs> awesome, such a... Yes, the other thing that Peter's been adding is a bunch of internal checks um, to kind of take some of the input code and test it uh, in, in situ without having to run it on a machine. Yeah. And that's been very helpful to check, the, uh, to check the correctness of the input subsystem. Yeah, I've been writing a lot of you know, storage engines underneath the database to do different things to test the upper layouts. Yeah, exactly. I was Time consuming, but once you actually refactor code to not make your eyes bleed, it seems like Right, well, one of the problems, of course, is that testing the X server is really, really, really hard because it takes graphics cards, and it takes input devices, and it takes every combination. Yeah. And, and so you really need a giant pile of machines. And a lot of the correctness is, is it actually displaying the output on the screen? And so it's actually fairly difficult to automatically test a graphics system. And so for my Intel video driver, I actually have a QA team who sits and actually runs applications. Tedious as, you know, but when you pay people, you can get them to do that. Has anyone tried, <laughs> has anyone tried like digital capture of the output and like doing yeah. big digital That'd be awesome. Streams? <laughs> so who's our next release manager? I, I'm willing to keep doing it. Um, as I said, it's one of, the, one of the main concerns was that the release manager would, would try to become you know, the leanest of X. And it's really not the same job at all. Linus really is much more of a, of a style manager and a content manager than the X release uh, manager is. The X release manager is all about seeing that there's consensus 
and mechanically merging stuff together. Um, what? It's much more of a secretarial role than a manager role. Yeah. So, you know, I, I keep I keep offering to do it because I frankly enjoy it and it gives me some visibility into what's going on, um, and I think. I think I have the, a longer history with the code than most people. So when, when I need to review code that hasn't been, that nobody else can review, I'm kind of the reviewer of last resort. And so at least there's somebody around who, who's going to make sure that all the code is re reviewed before it's put into the server. So if people, are willing, uh, if people aren't frightened by having the, the continual you know, uh, Keith Packard X server release, I'm, I'm keen to keep doing it. How many different people send you pull requests? Um, how many? That's a good question. That's actually pretty easy to tell. I can actually see that just by seeing how many remotes I have in my X server right now. I wasn't volunteering for the release manager job. I was, I'm happy to let you keep having it. I was just wondering if that was a burnout thing for you the way it had been for me in like 1.5. Okay, so this is a list of people who have ever sent me a pull request. We can't see it. It's an awesome list. 34 people. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I don't know where this screen is. Yeah. So I just did git remote. Origin doesn't count. Yeah, origin doesn't count. But you can see how many people have sent me pull requests in the last couple of years. It's quite a long list. Apparently 34 different people. And oftentimes that's just for one or two polls. You know, it's not for a, a long history of polls. Um, but, no, frankly, I'm willing to merge from polls or patches. It really doesn't matter to me. At least one of those is not a human. Transform is not a person, I'm sure. I think that was... But most of those, yeah, those look like names I recognize. Yeah. I think it's a reasonable approximation to the list of people who asked for polls. Okay. In, uh, that's it, is it? Thank you very much, Keith. I do have... And you already have one of these. I already have one of those. Uh, so we